All right. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone going? Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is not Dave Russell and Jason Buffington. This is Anthony Spiteri here and Michael Cade. And, you know, this is great. This is a, a very short notice session, but Cade and I are going to get take you through some V11 goodness. Um, so, yeah. So, Michael, this is going to be a very, very quick session. We're going to go 30 minutes, not a lot of time. We're going to do some live demos. What do you reckon? Yeah, we're going to try and get in as many as we possibly can, right? Squeeze it all in. But just before we hit the live demos, let's just do a very, very quick overview of V11 in terms of what, what's in it, what's coming out, what are the top line features in V11. Oh, but before that, let's go with the map. Where is everybody in at the moment? Let's see, Michael, what have we got? Where are people you, from at is the that, minute? Is that your map? I think your mum might be watching, Spiteri. My but, mum? In yeah, Australia. Australia no, 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 that's, pops that's up me. all green, which is really quite early in the, uh, early, was it early hours of the morning for you? <laughs> it is early in the morning. Yeah, it is. So anyway, Possibly it doesn't look like it. we've got quite a few. They're not a big stretch. But anyway, we'll see how, how we pick that up over the next uh, couple of minutes yeah. once we start getting into the live demos. Um, anyway, just to start off, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the top features of v11 as we announced them during the year right so you know what we talked about was um in vmon that felt like a long time ago but it was actually in june so not that long ago we talked about three top line features and the first one was talking about cdp or continuous data protection the second was all around um even more instant recovery live like we did a heap in v10 michael right we enhanced the back end the engine the performance the scalability and it's really allowed us in this v11 version to go and hit some more um i guess features and add instant recovery to not just vm functionality right and then i think finishing off the big overarching thing was enhanced object storage support so we may or may not be showing a couple of those demos in a few minutes um those are the top three features, right? And then when it came to Veeam Live, which happened uh, only a couple of months ago now, maybe even less, we looked at a lot more. We expanded on what was coming in V11. And when, with the list that we've got on the next slide, we can see that we really, really took it to the next level, right? There's a ton of firepower in V11. So, you know, we're looking at enhancements on the UI. Um, we're looking at engine enhancements. So the things that, you know, you guys don't really care about too much, but makes your experience with Veeam that much better, right? Um, people do care about the UI, and we've definitely looked at enhancing that, you know, some bits and pieces in there. The enterprise manager has gotten some some lift um, and some love there um, for the service providers out there, VCD to VCD replication. Uh, Michael is actually going to demo a bunch of the Linux repository stuff as well and just basically a lot of linux love storage integration nas enhancements um, for the automation guys out there restful api and a powershell module as well so you know that's only a small tight quick list um, but you know michael just on that there is so much more that we haven't really even you know scratched the surface of but in terms of demos what do you reckon get into them yeah yeah i reckon one more let's see how the map looks just before you jump into yeah your, let's see what we've got the on the map, map. Who's who's where and who's coming in from where? Oh, there, we oh, there we go. There we there go. Now there's some more people. There. I thought we were just going to be talking to ourselves for the next 30 minutes and showing some demos to ourselves. So where are they from, Mark? Big South America. Uh, so where have we got? We've got Brazil there, Argentina. Big Europe following there as well. Up there, Argentina. So my mum must be watching as well. All good. Nordic. Got a, got a bit of Sardinia going in there. Yeah, nice. Excellent. Stuff. I think we were actually getting more green coverage than uh, Dave and uh, Jason. Yeah, and I'm guessing that I'm <laughs> the only one. I'm the only one in Australia, just because obviously it's one o'clock in Perth and four a.m. in the morning in Sydney. And but you know maybe there were some people in New Zealand who were about to wake up to this as well. So anyway, with that, we're going to go through that map a couple more times. But should we start the demos? Because how long have we got now? Uh, yeah, we've got time. You go All for right, it. Let's do it. Okay, we're going to get through as Race much as possible. It. I'm going to start off. So let's flip to my screen uh mr producer let's rock to the screen there we go all right so what i am going to show you guys first is cdp right so i'm going to look very quickly at what cdp is all about now cdp is our continuous data protection effectively it's really about driving down rpos right those restore point injections and we're doing that 
basically for VMware, and we're doing that with the help of what we call the VMware uh, APIs, right? So vSphere IO APIs. This is something that VMware has been developing with us for a number of years. It's something that basically lets us dig directly into the hosts and intercept IOs, right? So let's take a look first and show you what it actually looks like to basically get that working. So you can see here, I've got a couple of vCenters. Um, if I click on the properties of that, you see first here, we've got this manage IO filters. So if you were to actually add uh, a vSphere host into Veeam Backup and Replication to start with, the process is pretty much the same. But now after the credentials, what we actually have is an additional um, pop-up that comes on and talks about the IO filters. So let's wait for this to pop through and actually get that up. Come on, come on. This might not actually do it because I've actually pre-configured this. So this might actually just go through once it finishes and collects all the disks and collects all the information. It'll basically go through and say, yep, I'm happy with this particular thing. Yeah, there we go, it's successfully finished. Let's go through that and do this a new way. That behavior has actually changed, Michael, between betas. Uh, Michael, why don't you just talk about the fact that we're on a particular beta here as well while I get this up? I made the point. I don't know who clicked on mine when I I shared out the uh, the uh, LinkedIn post earlier. Is that so? We're using a beta version of Beam Backup Replication version 11. We're getting close, but we're still on a beta. But I'd still stand by that some of the builds that we get a little bit early access to are still like they're pretty solid stuff, right? Like we can still we can still um, do what we need to do, especially from a lab and demo point of view. Yeah, absolutely. You know, not like cyberpunk. There's not a lot of bugs in it, right? <laughs> like for the for all those guys that are playing cyberpunk out there at the moment and, and know about that, um, that's been released with a ton of bugs depending on what platform. And, you know, but this is totally software agnostic from that point of view. But just to that point, that, that behavior that I just did, that changed between beta one to beta two, right? So in beta, in beta one, you could actually click through that particular setting, which is why I went that way. But now we've got this more, I guess, nicer UI perspective here to basically manage the IO filters. And now what you can see when we actually do that is we have the cluster loaded. So what this is gonna do, if we go through the process end to end and we add the cluster first time, this screen will pop up, right? But because we've already added this vCenter to Veeam Backup Replication is giving me the option to manage it separately now. So at this point, what we can do is check or uncheck that. The fact that I have this checked means that it's actually been applied and installed at the cluster level. And what this will then do is go and install the filter driver via a VIB and basically deploy it to any host that then lives in this cluster, right? And doing it at the cluster level is important because if we remove a cluster, uh, remove a host out of the cluster or bring one in, it's gonna basically automatically install it as well, right? So let's have a look and see what that actually looks like on the actual ESX uh, server in vCenter. So we've got these couple of uh, vCenters here and under the actual uh, cluster itself, under the configure tab, we've got the IO filter option here. And you can see here, we've got type uh, VEE CDP. And this is actually the one that lives. And it basically says now that we've got the IO filter active on all the hosts in the cluster. And the, uh, it's actually active for five VMs. So if we click on that, we're gonna see the VMs that we've actually got um, the filter applied to them. And I'm gonna show you what that actually looks like on the Veeam backup replication side a little bit later. Um, one thing to note here though, is basically, um, you know, this is all installed on the cluster level and it's always gonna be there and thereabouts. Now, the best way to basically do the configuration of the jobs, before I go back into Veeam backup replication, is basically to show you that we're leveraging tags effectively here to do the configuration of the jobs. So as you can see here, I've got a couple of uh, tag categories or tags specifically. So I've got RPO 30 seconds and RPO 15 seconds. So what I've actually done is I've gone and on these VMs, I've applied the tags to the actual VMs itself, right? So if we can go in here, look, let's have a look and try and get the actual tag itself to come up. My resolution isn't great. Let's bring that down. Where are we, the tags? Actually, I applied it at the cluster level. There we go. So you can see at the, at the actual VApp level itself, I've applied this tag, which means that it's applied down to all the VMs that live in this particular VApp here. So now what we do is we go back into Veeam Backup and Replication. And if I click on the actual jobs itself, you can see I've got this policy set up, which is basically a 30 second RPO policy. Now. In terms of CDP, we are calling these policies, not jobs. So that's a big differentiator here. Policy defined, 
uh, backup is where we were looking to go with this particular um, feature itself. So let's quickly edit this and go through what it looks like. Not too much difference here in terms of a typical replication job. This is the area here I've added the tag. So if you look at here, uh, we can obviously go via um, hosts, we can go via folders, uh, we can go via data stores, or we can go via tags as well. So you can see here, if we drop down, we've got the replication, which is the, the tag category, and then we've actually got the tags itself. So a really smart way to be doing it. And like Michael and I have been saying for years, um, you really want to start to configure backup jobs with tags. All right, once we've selected the actual VMs that we want to actually tag through with this policy, we then go and select um, the destination. This is obviously that we've had the source. Now we're going to do the target. So we're going in the hosts and clusters. Um, you can see here that we can target a specific host. We can target a cluster if we want. We can select the resource pool, the folder, or the data store. Okay. If we go in here into job settings, this is where we're going to source um, and select the source and target proxies. Now, the source and target proxies are very important when it comes to CDP in terms of what they're doing. Um, just as a side note here, we've done some really great deep dives into this particular feature, uh, particularly at Tech Field Day. I think it was, what was it, 20, Michael, that we did last year? Um, so if you want to see some deep dive advanced videos on CDP, just look up Tech Field Day 20. We might actually put some notes, um, some notes to that in the actual uh, LinkedIn bit uh, chat a bit later on. Um, one of the cool things we've actually added is the ability here to do a test, okay, and to see exactly what um, infrastructure we have set up for the CDP versus what we've actually selected in terms of VMs. And what this will do, it'll give us some guidance to say whether we've right-sized our particular infrastructure correctly. Okay, now let's give this a bit of time to do a bit of the checking and a bit of the algorithm that goes into play. Hopefully this works, Michael. We love doing live demos, don't we? There we go. Um, so basically what it's saying here, it's seeing the source proxy CPUs. It's giving, the, giving us basically the bandwidth that we have possible to use um, to manage the actual CDP replication workload. At the moment, it's showing that these VMs have got zero kilobytes required because they're actually not doing a lot, right? Now, if these um, VMs were doing a lot of IO, that would then basically trigger this to show what sort of um, you know resource we did need to actually facilitate a successful CDP policy and keep that within SLA. So I'm not going to go all the way through that. I think the last thing that we want to show here is basically the fact that this job is running We've got these replicas going into play here. If I open up this actual option here in the box, we're going to see a couple of different things. We're going to see some information about that the disks are processing. That means that we are replicating. Um, obviously, there hasn't been too much going on. Like I mentioned, these aren't very busy machines here. At the minute, we could pump some data through and we'd start to get some replication going across. And obviously, we've got this, uh, this um, SLA monitor here as well. So everything here is in place to give you a really good overview of what's actually happened, um, the amount of sessions, the amount of replica points that we've got going on as well. Um, I don't want to dig too much more into that because I want to get into the next demos. But again, just as a reminder, um, to see a deep dive of CDP, please check that Tech Field Day uh, video because it has actually got some great deep dive information around CDP. All right, Michael, let's go two for three for me. We're trying to do three demos each in this time frame, so that's probably why we're talking a bit quick and also why we want to try and rush through these. So the next one that I wanted to show was basically for our Veeam Cloud and Service Providers out there. And that's vCloud Director to vCloud Director Replication. Okay, this is something that we've been uh, wanting to get into the product for a long time. Finally, it's here. Now, the thing about showing this off is that for people that are sort of used to Veeam, um, it's no different really to our existing replication jobs. Okay, so here we can see that we've got the replication job here. You can ch choose virtual machine. And instead of vSphere, we now have basically a replication job of vCloud Director. So if we go in here, obviously we give it a name. Let's choose network mapping here. Also, a little bit of a thing here, high priority, Michael, just to sort of highlight another V11 feature that we can basically mark jobs, replications, or backup jobs as high priority, and it'll basically bump them up the list a little bit in terms of you know when they get processed and the algorithms that we use for that processing. Um, Going on here, what we then do with vCloud Director to vCloud Director Replication is we want to basically add the vApp. 
Now we can do this by basically going, uh, drilling down and we can add the whole organization or we can actually select individual vApps. So what we'll do here is we'll select the whole organization. And again, just for those out there maybe wondering what this is all about, what the relevance is to them if they're not a service provider. Um, you know, we see a lot of people basically, you know, moving workloads into service provider clouds. This just gives those uh, partners that you might choose the ability to replicate your workloads across. So the story here is great for you guys, not just the service providers, but if you're looking to consume um, a remote a, a infrastructure as a service VM or a bunch of workloads sitting in a cloud, if they leverage a service, you can get additional replication. Okay, so now let's go in here and select the destination. So you're seeing a bit of a trend here. We looked at CDP, source destination, the same sort of thing here. But now what we're doing is we're choosing a target vCloud director organization. It can actually be the same one. Um, if you look at here, we're actually using the same, but you could have multiple VCD instances here. You could choose that. So let's select um, this particular organization here. And effectively now what we're doing is we're able to then choose a storage policy if we have different storage policies and go from there. Um, we're able to remap networks on the fly um, if we had that ability here. So we can basically see what networks are attached to particular organizations. Um, and then basically, you know, select those particular networks on the source and the target if we want to do some remapping. So that just means that we're going to be um, consistent with the network at the both ends. Now, obviously, that's pretty much it. From there, it basically does, does replication. It works like that. A note just on this, it's not CDP to start with. That'll be hopefully coming in future versions. This is traditional snapshot-based replication. But, you know, I guess it's really important to kind of say that this is very, very good for service providers who are looking to basically offer another level of differentiation for their customers. Right. Michael, how are we going for time? Still good for one more demo from me? Yeah, squeeze another one in, mate. Right, let's squeeze one, one more in. And this one is all about object storage, right? It's all about leveraging, um, you know, object storage. We've basically been talking about this for a couple of versions now. We introduced this in 9.5 update 4. If we have a look at our backup repositories, you can see here that I've got a couple configured for Amazon S3 and Amazon Glacier. Before I talk about how we're leveraging Amazon Glacier and what we call the archive tier, what I want to do is show you that we're obviously adding an additional object storage repo for the capacity tier, and that is of type Google Cloud Storage. So something that our you know, customers and partners have asked for and was one of the things that you know, Michael and I got asked for quite a bit when we used to go to those things called industry events on the floor show. Um, they used to say, why haven't you got GCP support? We have it now. So V11 has that GCP support to add to the ones that you see there. Um, now, Talking about the archive tier, so very quickly, with the Scala Backup Repository, if I go to the Scala Backup Repository here, this is basically our software-defined um, repository where we have a number of different extents. Now, traditionally, it was just one extent, okay, and it just literally took different types of storage, put them together, and a top-level namespace, and that was it. What we added um, in 9.5 update 4 was the ability to basically take that and expand that out to a capacity tier. That capacity tier was backed by an object storage repository like you just saw. So if we click here on the properties of this particular Scala backer repository, you can now see that we've effectively got three. We've got a performance tier, which is basically that local landing zone. We've now got the capacity tier, which now we talk about as a short-term retention or a shorter-term retention, okay, where we do a copy mode or a move mode. And again, we've done some deep dives. Um, the best editions of these are at the cloud field days and the tech field days. And again, we'll link to those in the chat. Um, but now what we've done is we're actually going to extend that to the archive tier. And the archive tier is somewhere where you want to place backups for super, super long-term storage, almost like put it up there and never think about it again. And this is obviously leveraging things like, um, you know, um, Amazon Glacier and Azure Deep Archive as well, right? So we're really leveraging those very deep and cheap storage systems that are offered by the public clouds at the moment covering by AWS and Azure. The one thing I wanted to show just before we go to the demo, obviously I've configured all this previously. You can see that we're, you know, archiving GFS backups older than two days here. But what does it actually look like when we've got these backup jobs sitting there? And how, do we, how does it work when we want to pull them back? Um, so you can see here now under backups, we've actually got three or four different types here now, the cloud, the disk, object storage is basically that capacity tier. And then we've got the archive tier here. So you can see that I've offloaded a bunch of um, 
older backups to the archive tier here. So if we want to go and actually do a recovery, you can see that we've got a bunch of options and these are all the general options that you still know with Veeam. If I go instant Veeam recovery here, and I want to basically go to this machine, do an instant VM recovery. Now, quite interestingly, and Michael and I actually picked this up earlier in the day when we were preparing for this, you can't actually do an instant VM recovery directly off a um, Amazon Glacier or, or Deep Archive, right? The, it just doesn't work. The time to first byte, the way that we're storing the data, doesn't lend itself to an instant VM recovery. So when we go to basically choose a point here, and say we want to expand this out, we see that we've got a bunch on the performance tier, the capacity tier, but hey, we've got one on the archive tier. So let's select that one and see what we get. Okay, let's go and click on next, and it should come up with, okay, here we go. Archive tier data must be retrieved from the capacity tier, right? So a restoration can, can actually be performed. What it's doing here, it's going to effectively stage the data. It's going to pull it and drag it out of the archive tier out of that long-term storage and stage it into capacity tier, right? So it's gonna promote it into that S3. It's gonna do this in three different ways, depending on what you want. And we're giving our customers the options depending on you know, whether they want it quickly, whether they want it in bulk or standard. Now, every option is gonna vary in terms of the time, but also more crucially gonna vary in times of cost, okay? So this is really important here. We've really thought about this, but again, in a very, very quick way, this is gonna be a great feature for us, extending the, the sober to the archive tier adding an additional policy element in there, it's gonna be a great thing. So with that, that was three very, very quick demos. Um, we're now the, gonna basically hand over to Michael, but first, I think yeah, yeah, what we're gonna do- Yeah, I've got a quick do... question as well. Oh got yes, quick question. Questions. So um, Sonny has asked whether, do we, have a, do we have any specific calculator for required bandwidth to achieve CDP? Um, so the specific calculator that you, see, you, you saw there, that's basically what we've got. It'll give you a guide. We haven't got a specific official one just yet, but I'm sure that that will actually come as we move forward with the product. And, you know, the best thing about um, Veeam is our community, um, and I'm sure something might pop up in the community. All our great solution uh, architects will actually bring, bring something up as well. Yeah, another question, and I know everyone, more than one person asked this around the uh, release date for V11. I think without getting it, like we have to make sure that this is ready. We've got lots of customers. We have to make sure that it's gonna look after your data, right? So to put it into perspective, we've had beta one, we're now at beta two. We generally have RTM, RC, or RC, then RTM, then GA. So expect a similar time frame to V10, but I'm not gonna put like, a date on it or anything. No. So expect similar to, to hey. last year on that. Um, hey, Michael, I reckon you, you power ahead, and I reckon we, we might be okay going a couple of minutes over, right? Give you a little bit more time. Yeah, cool. I, I'm going to try I'm gonna try and get uh, – yeah, let's quickly just go and look at the map because I've just seen that Africa has gone completely green near enough. Well, so, so I've seen Kenya come through, South Africa, um, then lots of North Africa um, countries coming up there as well. I don't know lots if you've of got the, the list there. But, yeah, some – it's starting to be painted really green today, which is good. Challenge for for uh, Dave and, and Jace next week. Yeah, wow. So, uh, so let's kick off by so Anthony touched on Linux being a key focus for us from a platform point of view. We started that journey in in V10, and we're continuing that as we as we go on. And the first one to mention, which is probably the biggest, is around this hardened Linux repository. You've probably heard Anthony talk about. Um, talk about immutability from an S3 point of view, Amazon S3 or S3 compatible storage about making that capacity tier immutable. But what about primary backup storage? Let's make that immutable. So in here, I've got my hardened Linux repository. Um, and last year, what you're going to see here is that it's very much the same and it's bring your own Linux repository, bring your direct attached storage, bring your, bring your server with you, right? So if we go down to repository here, what you're going to see is you're going to see that XFS, which is the block cloning technology that we introduced in V10. So that's going to really reduce the amount of data or the amount of backup space consumed by synthetic full backups. But then what you're also going to see here is this make recent backups immutable for seven days. Now that means we are, and I'm no Linux guy and I've managed to set this up and it's we're really simplifying how we're going to use native Linux commands to be and, and 
file system commands to be able to make sure that your data is secure from not only ransomware and all of the cybersecurity threats that we see, but also malicious insider threats, right? So just for example, coming in, coming in here, going to our disk, hopefully it doesn't work. But if we go and find out what's on our hardened Linux repository and we, we go and let's go and delete that, we really are like, so hands off here, no smoke and mirrors definitely is live, is that this is gonna run through and it's gonna try and delete them but because it's not outside of that backup window or the immutable window, it's not going to be able to um, delete any of those. So it's going to try, but it's not go It's not actually going to affect anything. And th this is a massive thing, right? Look, there's no appliance here. It's bring your own Linux backup repository with some disk in, and we can make that immutable. There's no appliance that you have to go and roll. And I, I, I know that there's been talk within Anton's um, digest over the last couple of that, well, days, weeks around um, Ubuntu being the one that we're focusing on from a QA, but looking at other distributions as well. So you can see there, we haven't deleted anything. The backups are all still in place. That protects us. We can't go and modify that. Um, again, there's more demos to come around that later on. Um, another thing to mention would be when we're adding the Linux hosts. Now, whether these be Linux proxy, which I'll talk about shortly, but even just that Linux repository server, when we come to add, we have to supply some credentials, but not always root and not always God mode. It's probably not the best practice, and I'm sure most of you will agree that. So what we've also introduced into V11 is the single use credentials for the hardened repository. So, OK, you might supply root for that first initial add the managed service, put all the required components on but then we're not going to remember that. We never need that again to be able to put that, um, to be able to do anything to that repository. So one time um, single sign on users. We've also done some stuff around um, file level recovery. So whereas before for Linux file level recovery, we'd need, we'd require an FLR appliance and we would go out and we'd deploy that into your vSphere or in fact, all of our virtualization areas now, including Nutanix AHV and Hyper-V. Um, but we'd always have to deploy that appliance because we've gone all in on these other Linux managed servers. We don't need that anymore. So we're we're very much um, you can choose one of those um, managed servers to act as your FLR appliance that the old one hasn't gone away. So if you still wish to do it that way, then that's not going away. Uh, and probably another big one to, to really just quickly touch on is the amount of effort that R&D and product management have gone into from a um, Linux proxy point of view. So in version 10, this was only available to virtual appliance. So it would be a Linux box that lives within your vSphere environment. And that's the only transport mode that is available for us. And these transport modes alone, just I, I would the big call out here would be just go and make sure that you're using the right transport mode. Um, because they all vary in what they could do for your for your backup windows and all that all the back good stuff. But as you can see, this now brings Linux, a Linux proxy into being a first class citizen, right? Direct storage access to be able to go in and uh, back up from storage snapshots, be able to directly connect to iSCSI LUNs or, or fiber channel LUNs if you've got a physical Linux proxy now. All of that, the same uh, architecture that we see from a, a Windows proxy point of view is there for, for, uh, for Linux now. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, it, massive. Um, finally, and I think I've actually managed to get a few more. I think this is like six demos in, in one. <laughs> um, if I go down to our storage infrastructure, so traditionally we've always integrated with storage vendors when it comes to VMware backups, right? And you've seen that list grow over the last five years exponentially, like three, five a year type thing. Um, but it's always been VMware, and we've always had the ability to back up from storage snapshot, orchestrate the snapshots on-demand sandbox from storage snapshots, all of the uh, Veeam Explorers, that good stuff. But actually, where we were missing that integration was around NAS backup, which again, you saw in V10, so we're enhancing what we're doing there. Also, agent agent backups. So think about those physical database servers that have an iSCSI or a fiber channel LUN presented to. We can now use our, our storage integrations to be able to take those um, 
agent storage aware snapshots and backup from those snapshots rather than just taking it in the traditional sense we're just going to see it as a disk and we're going to pull it all out i think there's loads more to demo so much but i think that's probably a good full stop on the uh on the on the demos how's the uh map looking anthony yeah let's get back to the map because i think we're going to we're going to call out where everyone is so you ready for this list this is crazy so all right here we go <clears throat> uh then it's countries and u.s states because that's how it rolls um, Germany, Arkansas, Jamaica, UK, Czech Republic, Vietnam, Belgium, Norway, Missouri, Mexico, Tunisia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Netherlands, France, Croatia, Washington State, Cameroon, Bangladesh, India, Algeria, Argentina. I think everything here this reads like a COVID list. Ireland, <laughs> Italy, Brazil, Austria, Panama, Egypt, Wisconsin, halfway through. France, Morocco, Phoenix, <laughs> Arizona, UAE. South Africa, Iran, Canada, Romania, Dubai, Denmark, Miami, calling out Miami, Kenya, Abu Dhabi, Spain, Turkey, Costa Rica, and Mozambique. I don't think I've ever said that many countries in my life. Good stuff. <laughs> Good stuff. Right. Well, so that was there any questions in there? I mean, I think we've gone too fast really to to get any questions. Yeah, I think the one thing, if we just let's, let's, we got to finish with a couple of um, shout outs. But just finally, I think if we just finish on a slide that has the V11 session from v Veeam Live that we did, um, there's a link there. If you go to veeamlive.com or scan the QR code, um, Michael and I again presented. Um, we took a bit more time, not that much more time, but we basically went Less through all the, all the base. We didn't demo, we went through and explained a lot of those features, a lot of the lists, um, and basically, you know, went through them. So if you want to get a bit more deeper dive, do that. Um, but it's not too far away. Um, hopefully, you know, early next year, we will see the RTM followed by the GA. So we're really excited here at Veeam. And you guys should be excited too. It is a massive release. Um, Michael, do you just want to call out um, what's coming up on the live sessions over the next week or so? Yeah, I need the slide to show. But um, uh, so I think well, on Thursday it's us, so I have to remember that one. Where we're going to look at a, a recap of the year and technology and how things have changed and all of the uh, air miles. Product strategy have, live. Haven't uh, yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't grabbed, so that'll be a, another good good session. Um, then on Friday, uh, on Friday the community um, session with Rick and Ksenia, they'll be talking about the new Veeam legends. So you have our Veeam vanguards that are our community focused evangelists, our advocates, and then we have our Veeam legends, which is just a community, a wider community where we can share content and all that good stuff in there as well. And then I think Monday, yeah, Monday. Monday, um, next week. I think that's, is that Jay, back to Jason? Yeah, and Dave back to, to, back to the usual, that, back to the usual ones. Try and fill that um, map up with green stuff, right? I think um, they're doing something. On, I, think, I think they're doing some sort of retrospective on COVID and how that's that's changed um, the IT landscape or something like that. So David and Jeff will be back next Monday. But yeah, looking forward to our. Um, product strategy live on Thursday. Please join us for that one. It's sure to be fun and exciting. It's a little bit more relaxed, a bit more casual. Um, but with that, I think thank you for joining us today. Hopefully we gave you a little bit of an overview, gave you a bit of a taste of V11. And yeah, thanks for joining in.